Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Open Interest YouTube channel. I'm Mike Coe. Please remember, if you like this type of content and want to be alerted when we release new videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Also, feel free to send us your thoughts or questions either in the comment section below or by sending me a tweet at Michael underscore Co. After opening significantly higher this morning, equities reversed course and closed lower once again as investors weigh concerns about higher inflation, slower growth, and how the combination of those two could weigh on asset prices. I mentioned the possibility of stagflation, the combination of two painful economic realities, inflation and declining economic growth, in a recent video. And a viewer, Peter Lin, asked, can equity prices rise during stagflation? Stagflation does not necessarily preclude higher equity prices. The simple answer is yes, equity prices can rise during periods of stagflation. Equity prices can rise in the face of all kinds of broader economic conditions, including during bear markets, so-called bear market rallies. In fact, equity prices have risen the most sharply in some of the worst economic conditions in history. The German stock market skyrocketed during the hyperinflationary period of the Weimar Republic, and the stock market in Zimbabwe similarly skyrocketed when they experienced hyperinflation as well, at least in terms of their local currencies. We even saw six quarters between December of 1970 and December of 1980, the stagflationary period we usually refer to, uh, where we saw market increases. However, just because something happened in the past doesn't mean it's going to happen again. And many of those quarterly rallies were bear market rallies. So context matters. Overall, of the 39 quarters in the post-World War II era, where there was negative year-on-year -year GDP growth, but positive year-on-year -year inflation, the S&P rose 20, or about half of the time, versus rising two-thirds of the time overall. In this case, valuations are such that I believe equity prices are more vulnerable than they may have been in the past. Jones Trading, which interestingly happens to have a satellite office in an office actually I can see right out of the window next to me, came up with an interesting metric, what they're calling the reverse Fed model, which takes the earnings yield of the S&P 500 and combines it with the yield on US treasuries. And this combined yield, even net of the recent increase in rates, is about 7.2% in the bottom seventh percentile since data began in 1962. But what's worse is that that is lower than the annual CPI of 8.5%. This is the first time the total yield in their model was below inflation in six decades. I'm not saying prices can't rise in nominal terms, but it's less likely than under a healthier inflation and economic growth regime, and less likely still when you take these high valuations into account as a starting point. The bear market of the 1970s and the stagflation that likely helped cause it, also memorable for some steep bull markets in commodities like gold and silver, the latter in part because the Hunt brothers tried to corner the silver market. Another viewer, John Burchett, asked, GDX puts is my question. Well, <laughs> John's not saying whether he wants to buy those puts or sell them. Uh, if he's thinking about buying them, I understand the temptation to potentially look for shorts in some of the highest flying areas in the market right now, such as gold miners. But I have to say, that in my experience, commodities often swing further than one might guess. And in this case, gold miners are big potential beneficiaries of the regime in which we find ourselves. I'm personally long silver and I'm short puts in GLD and the options flows that we've seen continue to be bullish. Today's largest trade in GDX was a purchase of 10,000 SEP45 calls. The buyer paid $2.05. Uh, this is a difficult level for the miners because we're at the mid 2021 highs. But the tailwinds remain. The busiest GDX puts were the May 37s, but I'd suggest if you're considering a tactical short-term bearish bet, use put spreads. Uh, implied volatilities remain pretty high here. If GDX breaks out, watch out. Uh, your first loss will likely be your best loss, so cut them quickly on a breakout. Uh, we've highlighted so many days of bearish activity in a host of bond ETFs such as TLT, TBT, HYG, LQD uh, that I've kind of lost count here. But one viewer is asking if perhaps rates have, he said picked, but I'm assuming he means peaked. Um, well, we did see at least one institutional trader who might agree. A buyer paid 35 cents for 10,000 May 135, 140 call spreads. 
But I have to say, if rates drop much, it will likely be a short-term response to a big geopolitical issue, such as worsening of events in Eastern Europe, not a near-term normalization of economic conditions. Rates are still at very low levels historically, and with inflation where it is, they should be higher, and I believe they will be higher by year's end. Okay, so another viewer, Fred Walzer asked, in reference to the bearish XLU, XLU put spread example that we provided on options action last Friday, how do you do that with this ticker? The spreads are super wide. Do you actually do these trades or are these hypothetical? Well, first of all, you can always use uh, limit orders. Secondly, of course, the price is gonna differ on the first trading day after we talk about trades on Friday, which in this case was Monday. That spread, which we talked about at 132 on Friday, opened at $1.40. The prices were 206 and 66. Those were the actual opening prints in each of those. So pretty close to the prices we outlined. Uh, XLU is now about 1% lower than it was when we talked about that. So unsurprisingly, the value of that put spread has since increased. Uh, with respect to whether I do every one of these trades or whether it's an example, I do not do every trade we discuss on options action. Uh, and I don't happen to currently have a position in XLU. That was an example of how to trade Carter's thesis with options, and that's a thesis I happen to agree with. Uh, but I would just add to this, it is not possible for us to discuss every single trade that we happen to do or that we do for our clients uh, on the air, nor is it possible for us to trade every name or every strategy we discuss on the air uh, for ourselves or with our clients. Uh, while I wanna offer as much perspective to viewers as I possibly can, share my thoughts when asked, and would do the same for our clients, as a fiduciary, I have to consider the suitability, which is different than suggesting how or why one option strategy might be an appropriate one for a given thesis, especially those that are posed to self-directed investors looking to seek or uh, looking to play a directional uh, idea that has been offered by a party who's not even a part of our firm, uh, is completely independent of it. Uh, incidentally, the investment performance of our strategies is available to clients and prospective clients alike. So if anybody's interested, uh, they can reach out to us. And uh, assuming that you're um, a qualified investor, we can share those with you. Okay, finally, I wanted to highlight another enormous ratio risk reversal like those we saw in Borg Warner and General Motors yesterday. A trader collected over 13 million in premium, selling 75,000 July 40 puts and buying 27,000 July 45 calls in Pulte. Uh, again, this trade represents over 3% of the outstanding shares. And I have to say, I'm getting very curious about who is doing these trades. I'm assuming it's the same firm. Uh, Pulte reports earnings on April 28th, and I will continue to look at the 13Fs to try to narrow down the possible suspects. I'm Mike Coe. That's all I have for you on this segment. Again, please be sure to like, subscribe, ring that bell for notifications when we produce more videos like this one, and feel free to share your questions uh, in the comment section below or by sending me a tweet at Michael underscore Co. Thanks for watching. If you liked the content, please consider subscribing to the Open Interest YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash open interest. And of course, you can also follow or tweet me at Michael underscore co or go to our website, www.openinterest.pro. Thanks for watching.